Hello City Life Church, welcome to the conversation. Good to be joining you in your kitchen or your lounge room or wherever you're joining us here. Please make yourself comfortable, but perhaps not too comfortable because we're going to be talking about the weekend's message, which is all about the discomfort of the kingdom. So I've got Ewan Lowe with me. Great message, Ewan. Thanks for sharing with us on that. Hope you're feeling comfortable too, but not too comfortable. <laughs> Slightly <laughs> it uncomfortable. It really was hopefully. an informative message. I thought it was a challenging message too. And I liked the way you drew out the story of Peter and Cornelius from Acts 10 and the uncomfortable nature of their encounter. I thought that was really good. I'd like to hear some more on why you think it was such an uncomfortable encounter, encounter for them and also what lessons we can draw from this story, which occupies quite a large slab of the book of Acts. So obviously Luke, writing the book of Acts and the Holy Spirit, felt it was an important story and there would be things we can learn from it. Perhaps just for those who, you know, it's been a few days since the message, just, just or maybe someone didn't watch the message. So why don't you just give us a very, very brief summary of the story? Sure. Um, it, it's... So let, let me talk a little bit structurally, if you don't mind, Andrew, because as, as a scholar, you know, we, we, we kind of like to do these things with the text. We'd like to kind of say, oh, look, let's explore it as if we were reading, you know, a, fic- a work of fiction or something. Not, not that it is a work of fiction, but applying those conventions to, to explore, you know, where, where the story sits in the grand scheme of things and so on. Um, and a lot of scholars will say that this particular story is actually one of the, well, if not the major turning point in Acts, at least one of the big turning points in Acts. Because up to this point, you know, the a lot of Israel and, and the early church's um, focuses were inward, right? They were, they were interested in ministering to the Jewish people from which they came. They were, a, lo- a lot of them were mostly occupied within the region of uh, Judea. Um, uh, of course, they're, they're pushed out a little bit uh, after Stephen is martyred, but you know, they seem to be st- still quite focused that way. And this story is the one where everything changes, where all of a sudden we we begin to get this realisation that God's kingdom is about more than just the Jewish people. Not that there weren't hints of this all the way through, actually, the the um, texts all the way up to this point, but all of a sudden, you know, it, it's like God kicks down the door and is kind of like, well, they're in now, <laughs> you know. Um, so in this story, we, we, we see a couple of very interesting interactions. Firstly, we have a Gentile centurion who is a God-fearer. So he's a, he's a convert to Judaism, but he, he will still be a Gentile. And he receives a vision from God telling him to send someone to go and find Peter. He sends a couple of people to find Peter. Peter is on the roof. He's uh, hungry. <laughs> I, I, I find this continually funny that God, you know, speaks to our, through our desires sometimes. You know, Peter's waiting for lunch and he gets a vision of food, but it's unclean food. And he says, well, God, I can't eat this. I, I'm a good, you know, I'm a good Jew. Um, these, are, these things are unclean. And the voice says to him, what God has made clean, let no person call unclean. And this happens three times. And then the messengers from this centurion um, appear at the door and they say, hey, Peter, you know, come with us. So he actually invites them into the house, which isn't his house. Um, and of, presumably they stay. And then the next day, him and a, a group of other Christians um, follow them over to the centurion's house. The centurion greets him. Uh, they come in to the house and Peter's sort of a bit curious about what's going on. He says, I wouldn't have come except that, you know, a, a vision told me that I should not consider anything unclean. So kind of why am I here? The centurion explains so his normally story. he wouldn't come to... A Gentile house, a like Gentile that house, because of their their food traditions and their other traditions, it would make him unclean to do that. That's right. Yes, because um, only the vision. That was the only reason that he went. And, and, and he says that in the text. He says, you know, the only reason I'm here is because I had this vision. <laughs> but he's still not quite sure what's going on. And the centurion explains a little bit about what happened, and Peter says, "Okay, I think I now understand." And you know, as as is God's want, as Peter is talking, he's rudely interrupted by the Holy Spirit falling on people. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, at this point, everyone is amazed and they say, well, I guess, I guess the kingdom's open to the Gentiles now. <laughs> so they baptize this, um, this household of Gentiles and the, the repercussions from this story echo all the way throughout the text. You know, so um, this is from the this point first on. time we really see, what, well, not quite the first time, but the first major time we see this breakthrough beyond Jewish culture or 
Samaritan culture, which was related to the Jews, and then but coming to a Gentile or a non-Jewish person. That's right. And, and you know, God, it's interesting that because God is very, is quite gentle in Acts, in the way he transitions the, the early Christians, right? So you have, firstly, you know, they, they're within the Jewish people, and then we have the Ethiopian eunuch who is reading um, the scroll um, of Isaiah. So he obviously is already somewhat familiar with the Jewish religion. Uh, and same with the centurion, you know, the centurion, even though clearly a Gentile, is already a, a God-fearer. So he's familiar, at least, with some of the customs of the Jewish law. Um, so God doesn't kind of push them out to a complete Gentile straight away and you know make them super out of their comfort zone. But this is still a very difficult encounter for everyone involved, I think. So why is it such an uncomfortable, and you described it as uncomfortable, but it's uncomfortable and difficult. Uh, why was it so uncomfortable for Peter and the centurion? There's, there's a, a bunch of different layers to this, Andrew. Um, the first is the religious aspect of things. Um, as as we, we've already said, you know, for Peter, firstly, he in, invites the centurion's men into um, this guy Simon's house, which is a no-no, because they've made the house ritually unclean now. So Peter's, you know, put his friend, <laughs> put his friend out a little bit. But then he enters the centurion's house. Now, we have to remember that in this time, houses are a... Um, they're, they're a bit of a statement in and of themselves in that, you know, I, I remember attending um, a couple of lectures on archaeology and, and they think that most of these houses would have had idols in every corner of, every, um, maybe not every corner, but in every room, certainly there would have been an idol. You know, in, in some cultures, we still see that. The, the all-seeing eye is a really good example. And the idol is placed there to watch over the house. You know, um, the food that would have been served in this house would have probably have been food sacrificed to idols, which obviously the early Christians have a bit of a tussle about. So, so that's just one aspect of it. The next aspect would have been that the, the relations of power in that, you know, the centurion is, um, he's a military officer. You know, he's a representative of the Roman Empire. They were, um, they had uh, conquered, you know, they were ruling over Judea at the time. So the Romans were quite strongly distrusted by many anyway. And, and, and in my sermon, I said that, you know, one commentator points out that when Peter goes in, it's like he's being called to come to the police station to give an account of himself. That's what it would have felt like for Peter. Or the military so, you know, headquarters or something like that. Yeah, that's right. You know, it, 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 it's, it's like, you know, if you if you're under military rule and yeah, you know, the command local commander asks you to come down to the base, you think you're in trouble. So, so that there's that. Um, <clears throat> for, for Peter himself, you know, he's a Jew. He's, he, he's a nobody. He's a fisherman, right? Or an ex-fisherman who, who followed this guy. That, and so for the commander to, to summon him and ask him to explain things to him would have been a little bit unusual uh, because you'd think that he'd go to the high priest or the rabbi, uh, rabbi or someone like that. So there's a, a, a very big difference in power dynamics. And of course, there's the sort of, if you like... Um, ethnic or racial um, question, even though this isn't really a, a consideration back then, it's still something interesting to think about that, you know, Peter is a Jew um, and, 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 you know, they would have seen the Romans as an enemy. And this guy, Cornelius, um, he's a Roman, which means that, you know, he was, well, nowadays we'd say Italian. He, put, he grew up in a different part of the world, different cultural background, different assumptions, different everything. So these are people from completely different cultures having a very weird, uncomfortable meeting. So why? So that's why it would have been uncomfortable for Peter. Yes. You also talked about how it's uncomfortable for the centurion. Why would it have been uncomfortable for the centurion? I mean, he's the guy with the power. Surely this is an ordinary sort of thing he'd do. You know, he's, he's, he, other people are at his beck and call. Yeah, um, you know, one of the reasons would be, um, yeah, he, he's, he's, <laughs> he's being forced to consult with this, poor Jewish fishermen on matters of faith. And, and you know, this would have been quite uncomfortable for him because, like, like, you know, he, he would have been used to dealing with people in authority, presumably, people who are important. Uh, and so it's quite a humbling experience in that sense that God directly speaks to him, which also in and of itself would have been unusual, by the way, because, you know, in, in the Greek and Roman world, prophecy 
is something that floats around still, um, and we see it happen, you know, with with their own um, prophetesses and prophets and seers and seeresses and oracles, but it's not very common. So for the centurion to have received a vision in the first place is highly unusual. He probably wouldn't have really known what to do with that. So he'd be even uncomfortable about the vision. Well, very possibly, I think. I mean, you know, the text indicates that he's probably open to it because he's a God-fearer. But, you know, it's still weird. (laughs) You know, this is a... It would have rocked him. It would have maybe disturbed him. And he's he's looking for answers. Well, that, that's right. And, 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 you know, where, where does he turn to? Like he, the natural instinct would be to say, get me the, the chief high priest of the temple to explain this to me. You know, that's a very, uh, I mean, for example, what we see in Daniel, right? You know, grab, grab the, the local experts and, and bring them in. But God says, no, go and find this, you know, poor fisherman living out in the middle of nowhere and actually listen to him. And, and, and all of a sudden through the encounter, we see a little bit of a flip of the power dynamic because suddenly Peter is the one with the knowledge, with the experience, um, you know, not, and, and, and when he comes in, he, he is given the voice to be able to speak into the situation. He preaches a little bit and then the Holy Spirit falls. So, so there is a bit of a, an alteration of the power dynamic. So for the centurion, he's in his own house, but he's being confronted with this new reality. So very uncomfortable by someone who normally he would have the power over, but here he's looking to this unpowerful person for insight into his own situation. It's a really, really good uh, way of looking at the text there. So given that knowledge of the text and those observations we've made, Ewan, how could we now read the text in such a way we can start to apply this uncomfortable story to our own lives? It, it's interesting, um, Andrew, because a lot of us would naturally read the text as Peter, uh, I think we, we, we have a tendency to, whenever we see an early Christian in the story, we kind of go, oh, well, that's us. You know, yeah, we're, we're the early Christian. But I think it's important for us to, uh, obviously, it is important for us to do that because that is kind of where we sit today um, uh, for, for many people. But it's also important for us to recognize that in a lot of situations, we're the ones with the power. So we are the centurions sometimes. Um, and it's a challenging thought, you know, that when we when we go into different um, dynamics into different situations. Um, other people may be uncomfortable in meeting with us and, and speaking with us, which you know is something that I don't think many of us think about. We, we think about it when we're uncomfortable, for sure. But how often do we th- ask ourselves, you know, how do others feel when they're sitting and talking with me? Because that I think can be quite confronting for a lot of us. But it, it, it's a really good way of evaluating. Uh, the way we interact with people and asking, are we representing God's kingdom well? So we can, in a sense, participate in the story, either reading it as Peter, Mm -hmm. someone maybe in a position of weakness, but with a powerful message from God to share with the powerful. (laughs) Or we can also read it as the centurion, people who have uh, power and influence and that, but here, God's calling us to listen to the voices of those on the margins might be another way of reading the reading the text. That, that's a good way of putting it, Andrew. And, and and I suggest that for a lot of us, we're, we're not used to that. We're not used to hearing voices from the margins. And we we when we come into some of these situations, sometimes we can be a little bit um, imperialistic, I suppose, would be one way of saying it, you know, where we assume that we're in the right, you know, because we've got power, we... we we don't need to listen or, or what they say to us is not as important. But in this situation, it's, it's interesting because the spirit is speaking on both sides and both sides are challenged to actually listen to each other. They're, they're, yeah, they're both made uncomfortable. And, and there is, like I said, you know, the, 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 the power dynamic really shifts and alters all the way through this story, which is really exciting because I think what it shows us is that God's kingdom continues to be a place where status is not important. So, so that's, that's, yeah. So read it as Peter, I would say for sure. And ask ourselves, you know, where as, as minorities, as Christians or as immigrants or whoever, you know, what, what stories and what, um, what is the spirit saying to us to bring into different situations where we're faced with people of power, but at the same time as flipping it around again, if we're people of power, what is God trying to say to us through the words of other people that we come into contact with? 
So let's let's drill down into that a bit, thinking about reading it as the centurion, reading it when we're in a position of power and being open to the voices from the margins. How can we apply that in our own contemporary Australian society? What do you think this, that reading of the text could say, be saying to us? That, yeah, that's a really... I think it's a deep question, Andrew, because I think for everyone, our experiences of what the margins are will be different. You know, for some... For, uh, and, and there are clearly some people who are on the margins um, in our society that, you know, we... Come, that come to mind immediately. So, you know, people who are homeless often, um, refugees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, people who we, we kind of mentally delegate. It's an awful thing to do, but we all do it. We, we kind of think, oh, well, these people need my help, if you like. Um, so, so there is a bit of that saviour complex, which we need to <laughs> learn how to un- unwind from ourselves. But I suggest that people on the margins are much more subtle than that a lot of the time so you know um um what one group might be um our fellow immigrants you know i mean just about everyone in australia who who you know in 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 majority australia society is an immigrant in some way um and being an immigrant is really uncomfortable because you are on the margins you know you're you're forced to to come into a new society you 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 trim away bits of your identity that don't really um help you to fit in and so you sacrifice and you compromise who you are um, and you've put yourself in a position of weakness. So when we, when we recognize that and we, we work with immigrants and, and, and help encourage them to bring out who they are, that, that's a really powerful thing that we can do. And I think we, we can learn a lot from that. So you could Another- almost say, let's be open to listening to the voices of the migrant communities in our society because maybe God's speaking through them into our world. And well, if, we, if we're not listening, we won't hear the voice of God through their contribution to, to society. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm not just talking about, you know, our kind of model migrant groups as well. You know, they're, they're, imi, imi, we, there are so many different groups of um, people who have moved to Australia from all different parts of the world, and they all bring their own rich traditions and ideas and, and, and cultural um, aspects with them. And, and there's so much that we can gain and learn in, in speaking with them. You know, that, that's why we, we talk about listening, we talk about eating, and we talk about sharing because there, there has to be an exchange. It, it's not all one-way traffic, of course. Yes, and, and it, I know you said about eating there. Sometimes it's sitting down and having that meal with maybe someone from a Cambodian background or someone from an uh, Iranian background or someone from an, another migrant group. And when you sit down and you actually eat with them, that's when the sto- you start to hear the stories. That's when the relationship starts to be built. Mm, that's right. And, and it, that's uncomfortable as well because sometimes you eat things that you <laughs> wouldn't normally know how to eat or, or would have never encountered before. Oh, um, I mean, for sure. So, so some many people times I've had to discipline that. myself. And to discipline myself sitting down with another culture and they serve you something up and you don't know what it is. And, but you know, by eating, you actually build relationship. And well, that's, right. that's right. then as you build relationship, you hear some stories and those stories are really powerful ways of understanding their reality, but also sometimes God speaks to us through those stories. And, and, and you know, openness to being, to, to eat someone else's food is a really big indicator of yourself as a person. You know, like if someone, I mean, imagine like, you know, for, for you, like, or, or any of us, really, if someone came into our home, we'd invited them and we served them something, they go, oh, mm, it's a bit weird to me. I don't really want to eat that. Well, you know, naturally you're going to kind of be a little bit closed off to them. Um, but actually, I, I think it actually extends a little bit beyond that, um, beyond just eating together. But it, it's also in even entering someone's home, like like Peter does, like the centurion's messengers do, because everyone's home is a little bit different. And, and I think our cultural traditions permeate the way we run our households. So, you know, in my house um, and the way I grew up, you know, you take your shoes off when you come into the house. Other people don't do that. But, you know, so there's always a little bit of give and take when someone comes into our house, you know, do, do we kind of say, oh, you know, take your shoes off or, or, or leave them on or that's fine. And, you know, if, if someone came in and would refuse to do it, then I'd be a little bit more closed off, I suggest. So, so the, the, yeah, so thinking through, you know, the way we, not just the fact that we're interacting with people, but the way we conduct ourselves as, as I suggest, you know, representatives of the kingdom is really, really important. And hopefully it makes us all better people. Yeah, yeah. And, and part of that, and 
I think that's one of the reasons why this is so such a key story that Luke focuses so much on is we can, all of us, build walls around about ourselves to protect our culture, but he calls us actually to reach across those cultural barriers, despite how uncomfortable it is. And eating is one of those core practices that sometimes can be uncomfortable. So it's one example of the, the shift we have to make in order to hear from others and build relationships with others, listen, listening to them. And it's, it's, it's no accident that, you know, eating is such an important central part of the debates that we see all the way through the New Testament. You know, that there's, you know, many different arguments from different people about, do we eat meat sacrificed to idols? Do we, you know, is it important? How do we do it? You know, and, and you know, Paul's got one opinion, some of the others, you know, take a slightly different stance, you know, Revelation says, don't compromise at all, you know, so everyone has a, you know, there, there is a big sort of tussle, if you like, in the Christian faith early on about how to do this. And, and you know, like with any church, people have different approaches and different opinions. Mm. So it's something definitely is applicable to their society, but has a lot of relevance to us in reaching out to minority groups, people on the margins, like refugees, like the homeless. Let's talk about indigenous communities too, because that's another yeah. group that in Australian society is also very much on the margins. And I've been to visit a number of indigenous communities and it can be quite uncomfortable. You, you don't necessarily sit around a table, you sit down on the, on the ground, in the dirt, you, you pass around a cup of tea for everyone to drink from, and there, there's some practices there which can be uncomfortable, and yet it's so important to take those steps to build relationship. Uh, and there's many powerful Christian indigenous leaders who I think really do have something to speak into Australian society. The Holy Spirit is speaking through them, and we need to be open to those voices from the margins too. So you and What's your perspective on that, about hearing from the voices of our own Indigenous people in Australia? I think it's all the more important than ever before. You know, um, many... Well, one thing I will say, Andrew, is this, that, you know, as a, a, a more recent immigrant, if you like, um, to Australia, I find that many of us who, who haven't, you know, had a couple of generations here in Australia, we... This whole question of how we interact and, and listen to Indigenous stories kind of just goes over our heads because it's just not part of our daily considerations but that's something that i think is a great shame there's you know there's so much to learn from indigenous ideas indigenous lifestyles it's important not to tokenize um this either of course um and, and to you know well as we've been saying all the way through to listen right and to to, to have that interaction um but you know it, as an immigrant i i keep challenging myself how how can I bring this into greater consideration? Because, you know, this is an important part of Australia, an important part of his, Australia's history and an important part of Australia's future. You know, there's a whole group of people out here that I have very little contact with. I know almost nothing about, especially as an immigrant. Um, you know, I, I know about meat pies and I know about Collingwood and, you know, how to, may I well, barely know how to kick a football around, but I don't know about things like, you know, the dream time or, or any of that, you know, apart from the little glimpses that we get in Australian society. So for me, my challenge to myself is to try and seek out and listen to some of these stories in, in different ways, um, because I, I'm, I'm, I'll learn something from them and I'll gain a deeper appreciation and start to understand what some of the issues are. And this is one thing, Andrew, I think that has been very interesting over the last um, last few weeks, certainly, but also over the last few years, is that, you know, we're very quick to, to polemicize issues. We're very quick to take a stance without having actually listened carefully. And so I encourage all of us, I think, um, you know, yeah, to, to do what we've been talking about. Take the time to listen carefully to what people have to say, listen to different sides of, of arguments, you know, don't just listen to the people who agree with you because in the discomfort of hearing an opinion that's contrary to yours, you might learn something. So thinking about that in terms of our indigenous people, you now there's some really great books people can read to increase awareness of th things that people in those communities have been through. One is Once We're Warriors. It's not a Christian book, but it's still... Sorry, not Once We're Warriors, Why Warriors Lie Down and Die. It's a great book to increase our understanding of that. And obviously we can't do this during the current season, but I would encourage people also to consider as 
restrictions are relaxed, why not visit an Indigenous community? Why not go, we, we partner with a group called Australian Aboriginal Outreach. They run a yearly conference and uh, many of our people in our church have been to some of those conferences. It's a great way to go along and eat together, share together, talk together, learn together from Christian people within our Indigenous community in Australia and go part of that journey of listening and hearing and hearing that voice from the margins. So uh, look, sometimes it takes time to plan to go on a mission trip. I'd like to encourage people, if you're listening, do think about that. Why not in the next couple of years, make some plans to visit an Indigenous community and connect even with some of our Indigenous ministry partners. Last question for you, Ewan. We've talked mostly about looking at it from the centurion's perspective. I now want to just enter the story in a sense from Peter's perspective. Now, Peter was a believer in Christ. He'd been filled with the Holy Spirit, but he was kind of like a minority, a, a marginalized community, the Jewish people within the huge monolith of the Roman Empire. And increasingly within Christian society in the Western world, including Australia and the US, we used to be a majority, but Christians now are increasingly become a minority in a post-Christian world. So there's, it's, a, it's a good sense to realize that now. We've got to change our mind shift. We're increasingly in the minority. How can we be a Peter speaking into the majority culture of the post-Christian West. And what does this story say to us? Any comments on that? I mean, yeah, you, you know, you bring up some really good points, Andrew, in that we do live in a post-Christian world um, or post-Christendom world, if you like, where, you know, we we can no longer hold to these ideas that Christianity or, or, or the church, if you like, has got power to speak into different situations. And, you know, I actually am really excited about that, to be really honest with you. I, I think it's it's a good reflection of the early church in that, you know, when the church, when we as Christians get in power, you know, there's always a danger of us um, compromising a lot. And, and, and we see that the early church has a very uneasy relationship with power. So, you know, being in a position of powerlessness is, is quite natural. <laughs> it's, again, it, it's uncomfortable for us because we're not used to that especially over the last, you know, so 20, 30 years, it's really shifted. But, you know, there, there, there is a sense in that that's where a, lo a lot of God's actions do happen in powerlessness. So that's exciting. Um, in, in terms of being like Peter and going, you know, where we go, it's important for us to remember that we do carry an important message, I think, like just like Peter does, that, you know, that he is this guy who's a fisherman, you know, he, he, he's not really been trained in, in public speaking. Uh, and, and certainly at this point in the narrative, you know, he's, it's only been a couple of years since Jesus. So he hasn't had time to really mature or develop into the leader that he's going to be. So he still goes. He, he, he was probably nervous. He probably had no idea what was going to happen. But he went boldly to where he was called. He knew that he carried the spirit with him. Uh, and he knew that, you know, with that, he could achieve almost anything. And I think those are really encouraging thoughts for us that, you know, wherever we go, we do carry God's spirit with us, that, you know, we are called to bring about equality and justice in the name of the kingdom. And, you know, because of that, our cause is a good cause and we shouldn't ever be ashamed of that. Yeah, it's fascinating as you think about the story. In many ways, Peter kind of followed this blessed pattern we've been talking about over the last few weeks in our Acts series. He began with prayer. This whole thing began with prayer. As he began with prayer, he was listening to God and then he listened to the people who came to his door and then he went and responded to that and he was listening and watching and sense what was happening. So it was all him waiting on God to work with God. So as a began with prayer, listening. I don't know whether he actually ate with the Gentiles, but we know as we follow the book of Acts through, there was this challenge. They began to eat together. They had fellowship together, which was Jew and Gentile together. They went walk they you know stepped through that cultural barrier of not eating together. And then along the way they served each other and shared God's story. I, I just think there's a wonderful pattern there, aspects of it which come out in this story with Peter. Um, and, and the interesting thing, Andrew, is that Peter Peter does bless. So does the centurion, surprisingly. You know, the centurion is praying and he hears God's voice. He listens. He listens to what Peter has to say. And again, you know, there, there is that question about eating. But so there's a dialogue. They're listening right. to each other. Yep. And he falls at Peter's feet as if to worship him. So, so you know, that, that's already a good indication of his willingness to serve. So 
I mean, for me, the challenge there is then, you know, as we minister to people, are we actually, you know, recognizing that often God is speaking to them, that they may be crying out in prayer, that they may be, you know, doing the same things as us, maybe not with the same understanding as us, but, you know, they're ready, they're open as well, which is really exciting. Yeah, God works at both ends in mission. He works in the he works in both the community that we're ministering in and in our own lives and brings those two together. It's, it's, we're joining God at work. Oh, that's a great insight. You and it's been really good chatting to you. Our time's up, um, but I've really appreciated this chat. Thanks for your, your, your insights in this. Thanks for sharing on the weekend. And uh, why don't you pray for us and pray for those who are listening that uh, as we enter this story, this important story in Acts, whether it's from Peter's perspective or from Centurion's perspective, the Holy Spirit would speak to us so that we can be more effective and be a blessing in our own communities. Mm, no, thanks, Andrew. Um, well, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to open up your word and to delve into it. And for every single person who's listening, Lord, I ask and I pray that your spirit would continue to speak powerfully to each and every single one of us, to motivate us, to know that you are alongside us. And as we go into all our different contexts, whether we're in positions of power or positions of weakness, help us to begin with prayer, to listen to what others are saying, to eat with others, to share and to serve. Help us to be real blessings to all of our communities that we're a part of, wherever we are. Let us remember that we are your representatives of your unstoppable, unshakable kingdom everywhere that we go. So bless us mightily, we ask in your name. Amen. Amen.